Hello and welcome to another Healthy Bite, although this week it is also an unstress episode. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Well, this week's episode, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting and talking to a true pioneer in the dental world, Dr. Theodore Belfort. In, uh, he's a dentist in New York that has developed an appliance that is worn by a patient at night and uh, helps develop the upper jaw and helps an individual fulfill their epigenetic potential. Yes, we have evolved to have 32 teeth in our mouth. That means 16 teeth on the top and 16 on the bottom. And that means we have broad, flat upper jaws and lots of room for our lower jaw and tongue. And we are far less likely to have respiratory problems because um, the shape and size of your upper and lower jaws determines the shape and size of your upper airway. And the fact that most people have less space, not enough space for all of those teeth is actually of some significance. Now, this week's episode, we explore that, but I wanted to stitch in and replay for you a very important episode that we did oh, probably over a year ago with the author James Nestor, who had written a book called Breathe, The New Science of a Lost Art. And it's a, it's a bestseller. It's been translated into 50 or 60 languages, and it has brought the subject of how well we breathe to the public. It's it's a terrific book and it was terrific to talk to James. And the reason I'm re-releasing it is because when James realised what narrow jaws and crowded teeth meant, he then went on to explore how he could improve that. Even at his age, I think he was probably in his 40s at the time, but we have patients in their 60s and 70s, similarly, who have these kind of appliances. He found Dr. Ted Belfort who I spoke to on Saturday. And I know that James Nestor and Ted Belfour don't mind referencing each other. And I know that James Nestor has said to Ted that he is most welcome to show his cases and to talk about what he did. And what he did for James Nestor was he made him an appliance, an upper appliance, which um, stimulated the growth and fulfilled, if you like, the epigenetic potential that lay within James's and every one of our jaws. So I thought it was a timely opportunity to replay the Unstress episode with James Nestor. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Irwin. Well, today we are exploring the breath. And as our guest says, this will be of interest to anybody who breathes. So I know that for a fact that that includes all of you. And breathing is something that is just part of our lives. We give very little thought to it. How often do we breathe? How much do we breathe? Do we breathe uh, from our nose? Do we breathe through our mouth? Uh, how important is it? Well, as you, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you will know it is extremely important and um, it's so accessible. That's what I love about it as well. Just like sleep, these two interventions of getting sleep and breathe right are absolutely transformative and they are cheap. They do not cost you anything. All you need to do is be aware of them and make a commitment to prioritize it, which is why we're often revisiting both those themes on this podcast. My guest today is James Nestor. Now, James has written for the Scientific American, Outside Magazine, Men's Journal, National Public Radio, The New York Times, and much, much more. His book, Deep, Free Diving, Renegade Science and What the Ocean Tells Us, about ourselves was the finalist for the Penn American Central Best Sports Book of the Year and a BBC Radio 4 Book of the Year. James has appeared on dozens of national radio and television shows, including ABC's Nightline, the ABC, uh, the C CBS Morning News, the NPR. He lives and breathes in San Francisco. His current book is called Breath. The New Science of a Lost Art. Now, I hope you enjoy this conversation I had 
with James Nestor. Welcome to the show, James. Thanks for having me. James, uh, breathe is a or breath, but breathing is a, a central pillar to what this podcast is about. So when I saw your book, Breathe, The New Science of a Lost Art, I thought, wow, okay, you're coming at this from a non-professional point of view. You're a, you're a journalist, an author, um, and, I, and I just love the book. I think you've covered some incredible territory in it. I, I wondered if you might just tell us, how did you come up with this? Where, where, where did this interest start? Yeah, I never set out to write a book about breathing. This was, this was not on my to-do list in my life, but so many things kept accumulating, so many stories, I saw so much data, so many studies that after several years of picking around at this idea, everything sort of came together in a cohesive picture. And I guess the real jumping off point for me was to see free divers, these people who have yeah. trained themselves just with their natural bodies to, to hold their breath for seven, eight minutes at a time, to dive down to 300, 400 feet. I mean, none of this we thought was possible. And yet, there they are. And I thought, what else don't we know about our bodies? Where else can breathing take us? And that's what I spent several years researching. Mm. I love the way you say this book will be of interest to anybody that breathes. And, um, you know, I, I'm guessing, I, I'm not guessing, I know everybody that's listening to this can share that because they're all breathing. Uh, and you, you wrote your first book, The, the Deep free diving, renegade science, and what the ocean tells us about ourselves. I mean, that in itself alerts you to the power of the breath, doesn't it? Tell us a bit about that book. It does. It's, you know, I saw where breathing could take us underwater. I saw the power of breath holding. But what I wasn't able to get into in that book, because that book is really about the human connection to the ocean from the surface to the very bottom of the sea. So free diving is closer to the surface. Then there's all these other areas in the ocean there. So I kept finding free divers who understood free diving is not a competition, but as a meditative practice. And they were telling me, it's like, well, the benefits of breathing this way of really honing this skill extend far beyond what we're doing here. You can use breathing to help heat your body up when you're cold. You can use it to heal your body of so many chronic conditions. And this all sounded crazy to me, but the more I went out in the field, the more I talked to researchers, the more I realized what they were telling me was, was 100% correct. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that I, I, well, I find fascinating about this whole subject as well is that we as humans think of ourselves as pretty special, and we are. Uh, I mean, you just have to look around the world to know we've made an impact. Um, but there's something about humans that also make us quite unique. Uh, we've got crooked teeth and problems breathing. Well, tell us a bit about that, the modern humans and their whole journey there. Yeah, I had no idea this existed. Uh, I had crooked teeth. Everyone I knew had crooked teeth growing up. I had braces, extractions, headgear, all that stuff. And I thought that this was just a normal part of being a human. And, you know, I looked at the reasons why people had crooked teeth when I first started doing this research, when I started hearing these, these quakings that people were saying, uh, you know, I think it's attached to something that oh, might be correlated to food. And the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S. say it's hereditary. They say it's, it's normal. It's a, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we all started off the same way, why do some of us have and some of us don't? The thing that absolutely shocked me was that if you look at ancient skulls, I looked at a lot of ancient skulls in this research, they all have perfectly straight teeth. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. You can go back 50,000 years, 500,000 years, even 500 years ago, the vast majority of humans had perfectly straight teeth, these large mouths, these large jaws. If you look at humans today, but 90% of us have some crookedness in our teeth. So all of this change happened in just a few hundred years and something obviously caused it. You can't just say it's genetic. That doesn't mean anything. If 300 years ago, we all had straight teeth and now we don't. So it turns out that our modern diet has done this to us. Our teeth are so crooked because our mouths are so small. And when you have a small mouth, you have a smaller airway, which is the main reason so many of us suffer from sleep apnea snoring, other respiratory problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's probably worth uh, mentioning that 
uh, we are pretty unique in the world in animal kingdom because there aren't any other, literally there are no other species that enjoy this feature or suffer from it anyway. Enjoy, enjoy it. Enjoy is... <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> not the best way. <laughs> Perhaps not the best way. But, but uh, yeah, and, and if you don't believe me, look at pictures of animals in the wild. I looked at a lot of those too. They all have perfectly straight teeth. And to think that all animals had straight teeth, because why would their teeth be crooked? Why would our teeth be, be crooked? This is not a trait that held any evolutionary advantage over a competitor, okay? Having crooked teeth does nothing to allow us to compete stronger. So this idea that evolution always means survival of the fittest, always means, no, no, that is not true. Evolution means change. And if you look at the human species right now, I don't consider 40% of the population in the U.S. having obesity as an advantage over their competitors. We're changing in ways that are very damaging to our health. And you and I saw in your book, and I'm not sure whether you didn't come up with it, but the de-evolution, you know, not, not evolution, but de-evolution. And, and it's so interesting too, isn't it, that medical practitioners, health practitioners who are advising us are just accepting that as normal. Yeah, and it's, it's really no, I don't want to point fingers. They're doing the best that they can, mm -hmm. seeing 20 patients a day. I mean, yep. it's insane. Yep. But the way that the system is set up is, at least in the U.S., where it's private healthcare system, is, you know, people, people come in and the doctors are, are educated to treat pathologies, to treat chronic problems. If you have a low-grade underlying condition, you can't even see anyone until you're really sick. And this is what, this is not my hypothesis. This is not my viewpoint. This is what I heard from at least a dozen doctors. My father-in-law is a pulmonologist. And this is what he told me first off. He's like, I don't even want to see people until they really need me, till I have to cut out some lungs or I have to do some, some surgery, some serious operation. So meanwhile, the rest of us just have this low grade chronic conditions that just get worse and worse the older we get until we need serious help. So it just seems like a very strange way to live your life, just getting sicker and sicker. Shouldn't you go the other way and try to get healthier and healthier? Well, well, James, that's the mission statement of this podcast. And I've often said uh, that our current health system is a great economic model. It's just not a very good health model. So I think you've said it in a different way, but the same thing. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. And, I, and by the way, I have no solutions on how to fix it, right? I know mm. this is extremely complicated, but the one that, thing that we can do is take more of our health into our own hands. And that's what podcasts like this yeah. and other books. And you see this huge revolution of people who are so angry from not getting proper care and who have in many cases been lied to, been told to eat high carb, high sugar food, and you're going to be just fine. Start off your breakfast with a big bowl of che Cheerios or, or mm. tricks. It's not fine. Um, yeah. and, and so the, the positive end of this is we now have awareness and with awareness, we can really elicit some change. Which is why I love the book because of its accessibility and the way you're coming at it from an every person. And I say that with all due respect, you're not coming at it from a physician researcher uh, point of view. And this is something that's available to us all, you know, to all of us that are breathing. We have an opportunity here. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think of diet, which is so important to health as well. When you're asking someone to completely change their diet, the same diet they've had for 30 years, you say, you got to go keto, you got to go paleo, you got to go vegan, vegetarian. That's a full lifestyle change. And there's no doubt that there are so many benefits from changing your diet to healthier whole foods. Of course there are. Same with exercise. So to tell someone who's been sitting on a couch for 20 years that they need to now go walk 10,000 steps, they say, whoa. But breathing is something we all carry with us all the time and you can improve your breathing whether or not you're sitting on that couch whether or not you're jogging whether or not you're at work and you can show measurable benefits in a very short amount of time and it's free so there's there's no side effects to this beyond feeling better and having your body operate better so that the accessibility of it all uh really really appealed to me
Yeah, yeah. And listen, you mentioned skulls, looking at skulls, and part of your book, now I've been to Paris many times, and it's a beautiful city, uh, but you explored a side of it that I have never seen before, and you did, and I wondered if you'd share that with our listener and what you found. Yeah, so I had heard that there was this big transition in the human skull. This was right at the beginning when I was getting deep into this research where I really knew that there was a book here. I had heard that there was this pretty sudden transition. So where we went from having perfectly straight teeth and large airways, large nasal apertures to crooked teeth and small mouths and, and less room for our airways. So I had seen ancient skulls of uh, plenty of those uh, online, but I'd never seen them up close. This is before I got access to labs. So, right, because again, this is right when I was starting out. So I had heard that there were the, the Paris catacombs, which I'm sure a lot of people have been to. This is a, a special uh, tour that you can take and you can see a bunch of old skulls. But I had also heard that the catacombs are just about 5% of the Paris quarries, which extend something like 170 miles underneath the streets of Paris. I believe that. I... <laughs> and there's six million skeletons and skulls down there. And I thought, wow, well, that would be cool to go down there without any guardrails, plaques, where I could just look at these skulls. I could do whatever I wanted. So through friends of friends, which shall remain nameless, because I won't say this is the most <laughs> legal thing to do in the okay, world. we should do should we cut this out of the podcast <laughs> so, no, we'll go on we'll i'm go. fine with it it's already done it was done. years ago yeah but i managed to get access to some people who had studied these areas so because you could get lost down there and, and mm. you could not find your way out so people have died before but what was so fascinating is they built these limestone quarries, which are just tunnels, and they use that limestone to build all of Paris, the Louvre, all that, that white stone all over Paris. That's where it came from, right under Paris. Mm. So they moved all the dead bodies down there because they didn't know where else to put them. But what was amazing to me is they would have the quarries, which were 60 feet below Parisian streets, would go in line with the streets. So, so you would know where you were going. So you could be underground and know exactly where you were if you were above ground. But since all of the streets in Paris have changed, there's this ghost map of the way that Paris was before with all of these street names that no longer exist. And, along and the with street ghost, names are down there? Yes, yes. Yeah, this was Mark. before the big houseman rejig of the Napoleonic times. This, this was, yeah, those quarries have been down there for at least a thousand years, 1500 wow. years. Wow. So, so because Parisians being Parisians, they believe that if you owned a house on a certain piece of land, that extended all the way to the core of the earth. Fantastic. So they were staking out that they, this land 60 feet under them belonged to them. It doesn't really. Hmm. Um, or maybe it does according to their laws, but we were able to get access down there. And there's skulls all over the place. And we were able to find this uh, burial ground of cholera victims from the early 1800s. And this was right at the edge when our mouths just went to hell, when we all started getting crooked teeth. And I was just surrounded by, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of skulls. And you could, you could see what happened. And they look so different from the other skulls that, that I had seen, the older skulls. So it's amazing to see how perfectly we were shaped by nature and how drastically changed we've been through industrialization. Mm. And it's a theme that I've explored myself on the podcast many times and, and I've spoken, but, but we, and you referenced the work of Weston A. Price, which our listeners, and I'm sure you've heard many times in your travels, um, and about nutrient-dense diets being one aspect of it, but there's another aspect, and that is the chewing, the actual chewing. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. So industrialized foods were deficient in so many, especially fat soluble vitamins. And so Weston Price believed that because of the lack of these essential vitamins and minerals, bones did not develop properly. So mouths grew too small, teeth grew and crooked. He was right to a certain extent. So there is, uh, there is evidence of some malnutrition in, in these cultures that he was studying who switched from a traditional diet to an industrial diet. But what I found more interesting was that 
It doesn't really matter, even if you have the proper amount of vitamins and minerals, if you are not chewing, especially in when you're very young, your face doesn't model properly. So your mouth doesn't grow wide enough, which is why you get crooked teeth. And they've done studies uh, just in the last few years looking at infants who were breastfed versus those who were bottle fed. Now, breastfeeding requires a ton of chewing stress and it helps literally to push the face out. When you're pushing, pushing, I should say, pulling the face out like that, the upper palate can drop properly. You can have a wider mouth. And they followed these kids and found that those who were breastfeeding have a significantly less incidence of sleep apnea and snoring because they have, they have larger airways. So to me, it makes perfect sense. There's no controversy about this, but that so few people are talking about it or acknowledge it, I just thought was, was crazy. Mm. Interestingly, uh, I yesterday was exposed to a new piece of research that linked chewing, mastication to cognitive function. So it goes even further than just developing good habits that develop good jaws. It actually impacts on our brain function as well. For sure. Sharon Moore, uh, who I was just corresponding with, she's an Australian myologist. I think that's that's the name of uh, where, where she does a lot of work with, with different people to allow them to exercise their mouths in a certain mm -hmm. way to open up their airways. But chewing, she, I learned from her that, that chewing helps decrease stress. It helps reduce cortisol because parasympathetic, you, when you have saliva flowing, uh, you should be in a parasympathetic mode so you can digest better. It helps brain function. It increases circulation of the brain. I mean, I can go on and on and on, like essential, essential things for proper development. And if you think about even the food that we consider healthy right, right now, smoothies, yogurt, avocado, it is healthy stuff. It's got a lot of nutrients in it. There's no chewing involved in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole field of oral myology is a whole new and emerging area, uh, which, uh, you know, if you were a dentist or an orthodontist, and I happen to be a dentist, um, you know, and you weren't working with an oral myologist, I think you're really missing out on a very important part of it. But listen, one of the, uh, you know, people don't really think that uh, breathing through your mouth or breathing through your nose, uh, breathe. and in fact, you mentioned in your book, again, that many professionals also, hey, it's not that important. But you went through something at Stanford University that kind of highlighted how important that was. Tell us about that study. Yeah, so I had been talking with the chief of rhinology research at Stanford, a great guy named Dr. Jayak Arnayak. We had had numerous lunches, these long three-hour lunches. He was telling me about his research, all of these crazy, he you know, co-authors 20 different studies a year. This guy is just a machine. And so he knows the benefits of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. And there's no controversy about that. So if anyone tells you it's the same thing, they have not read the research. <laughs> they, and, and there's so much research in it. There's at least 50, 60 years of research at Stanford, at Harvard, at Yale, showing, showing the advantages of nasal breathing. So he didn't even want to get into that. He's like, that, th there's not an argument about it. But what he didn't know and what I didn't know is how much of this damage comes on. So we know that if you're a mouth breather, that can cause certain neurological disorders, it can cause metabolic problems. You're going to be apt to have more cavities, uh, which was crazy because there's more acidity in your mouth, which is a, a hotbed for cavities, on and on and on. But again, does that damage come on after six months, six years, three decades? Like no, nobody knew because no one had done a controlled trial uh, yeah, of it. No one had done a study. And I asked him, He's a guy at Stanford. He's, you know, one of the best institutions here in the U.S. for research. I said, why don't you do one? You know, come on, you're, you're at the top of your field. And he didn't have the money. He didn't have the time, yada, yada. And so I convinced him. I said, well, if, if I volunteer, if I get someone else, because it'd be so much more important to have an N2 than just a single person, will you, can you dedicate at, at least your, your lab and look at the data and help us out? And he said, absolutely. So Game on. We had to pay for all this stuff at Stanford, which was just crazy. Uh, pulmonary function tests, not cheap. CAT scans, not cheap. But uh, he, he got us some significant uh, discounts. But what was amazing to me, instead of it taking six weeks or six years or whatever, 
within a few hours, my blood pressure shot through the roof, just, just about 20 points higher than it had been into stage two hypertension. Well, just and tell then, us firstly how, what, what, the, what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go on. I mean, I've read it, but I want to share it with here. my listeners. It's been a long day. That's all right. So the study yeah. uh, got off on, on, on the wrong rails there. That's all right. Uh, the study was designed to be a 20-day study. It was actually 21 days. The first 10 days, we, we had our noses plugged. So with silicone, a little piece of tape over this. So we're only breathing through our mouths. A lot of people say, say, oh, that's horrific. This is some jackass stunt. Well, if you look at 25 to 50% of the population mm. is habitually breathing through its mouth. And a lot of kids are so plugged up, they're just breathing through the mouth all the time. So I don't view this as being some extreme stunt. I view this as lulling ourselves into a position that so much of the population knew. Mm. So we were calculating data three, three times a day, sleep data, I mean, you name it, oxygen, CO2, nitric oxide. We had a full lab set up in my house. And so uh, the other 10 days of that was gonna be almost entirely nasal breathing. Can't nasal breathe all the time, but majority of the time we were just gonna focus breathing through our nose. So if the pathway through which you breathe doesn't matter, then both of those data sets should be basically the same. They were so incredibly different. And what I mean by that is then the first couple hours, blood pressure through the roof, you know, blood pressure goes up and down throughout the day, but I had never seen my blood pressure so high ever in my life. And then I went to bed and I started snoring and I had not been snoring. So we took two weeks of baseline data, snoring an hour and a half. Then a few days, I was snoring four hours um, throughout the night. The other subject, Anders Olsen, was snoring even worse than me. We both got sleep apnea. Um, so our, our sleep quality just went into the gutter. We were fatigued, anxious. I mean, everything. I could go on and on. But it was so dramatic and so drastic that it, it floored us. We were getting pretty concerned about our health about a week into it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's quite a, a, a crash course, a crash course in, yeah. in the, the importance of nasal breathing. But um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, too, is that this isn't new. I mean, to say breathing isn't new is ridiculous, of course, but to say that some of these ancient practices, you know, this is, I, I love the fact that we have so much to learn from our past. Uh, and, uh, you know, about how we ate and how we moved and all of that, but how we breathe. Tell us a bit about some of the ancient uh, practices, because the book's called The New Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art. So what was interesting is to dig through these archives, and I spent months and months in medical libraries. I'm fortunate enough to be in San Francisco, so I'm near University of California, San Francisco, very well-known medical institution, and then Stanford as well, and Berkeley, on and on. So I kept finding these ancient scripts that were all saying the same thing. And this doesn't matter if you were looking at ancient Hindu script or an ancient script from the Chinese, ancient Chinese, or even Greek. So they were saying that nasal breathing is healthy breathing and mouth breathing is very bad. And the Chinese went so far as to write seven books on breathing. Mm -hmm. All the awful things that are going to happen to you if you breathe improperly, specifically if you are breathing, especially inhaling through your mouth and all the wondrous things that are going to happen to you, all the health you're going to be able to, to celebrate if you are breathing through your nose and if you are practicing other breathing techniques. So just the same exercises repeated in different cultures, which from what I understand did not have contact with one another, but came to these same conclusions. And so now with all the instruments and technology that we have, I think it's fascinating that we can actually test this stuff and we can test these claims. And what we've been finding for the last few decades is that they were spot on with so much of it about breathing slowly, about breathing through your nose, about concentrating on your breath. These are simple things that can really make a transformative effect to your health. Mm. And you mentioned also um, the, the, the effect of it on the nervous system and that not only the breathing in, not only the breathing out, but the, hold, the holding of the breath too. Yeah, and so we can, you know, if anyone's listening to this right now, you can just place 
your hand on your heart. And this is what a breathing therapist did for me when I first started getting into this. You can just breathe in to a count of about three and exhale to a count of about seven or eight, but, but don't push it. Just, just very, very casual. So two, three, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale to three, one, two, three. Exhale to that same count. And you're going to feel your heart rate getting lower and lower and lower as you exhale. And as you inhale, the heart rate's going to go up just a little bit. So this is not a placebo effect. This is you hacking into your nervous system and controlling your heart rate. And when you control your heart rate like that, you can control your circulation as well. And this is why slow breaths, especially with a longer exhale, a lot of people who have cold toes or cold fingers, you're gonna feel this warmth to your fingers and this warmth to your toes. That is more circulation to these areas. So it's fascinating that all of this stuff in our bodies, not all of it, most of it just works in the background like a software program, you know, which is great. We don't have to think about it. But when we take control of it, we can actually command it. And we can, we can not only affect that, the way that our bodies are working, but we can actually affect how our brains are working by increasing more oxygen, by synchronizing those different waves in our brain, all through breathing. Mm, it's, it's, look, uh, I, I'm like you, and I've been in. I've been a professional for 40 years, and I'm still amazed every time I learn something else about this power, the power of this simple thing. You then went. Oh, you actually um, invented <laughs> the term pulmonaut. Pulmonaut. I hadn't heard that before because, as you pointed out to me before we started, you invented that, and I, I thought, wow, what a great expression. Tell us about the pulmonaut. Uh, and some of the heroic stuff that some pulmonauts have done. I mean, you know, there's, there's been, they're out there. Yeah, I wanted to develop an umbrella term because not everyone fit. They're the, the medical researchers who have been the doctors, pulmonologists, cardiologists who have been researching breathing. And then there's breathing therapists who are researching breathing. And then there are just these freelance people who came to breathing completely randomly because nothing else in their lives were working and they found breathing and it worked so well that they taught it to other people. So I consider all of them pulmonauts. Mm. But uh, a pattern kept developing and I was not looking for these stories, but these stories kept repeating the same pattern where we would discover something about breathing and it didn't matter if it was discovered at Yale or at Harvard or whatever. <laughs> Um, and then we would forget about it about 10 years later after the person who discovered it died. And then it would be rediscovered with a different name in a different place and then forgotten about again. And it, all these stories had the same arc. And it was especially frustrating when you see these certain breathing therapies, uh, the ones developed by Carl Stau, which he was able to, I won't say cure emphysemics because emphysema is not curable, but it can feel like a virtual cure if you're engaging the rest of their lungs. These, these people were literally left for dead in hospitals. He allowed them to get up and walk out and go live somewhat normal lives by just showing them how to breathe properly. And Katerina Schroth in Germany did the same thing. She had scoliosis and she learned how to stretch and breathe in certain ways to straighten her spine. And if you don't believe me, you can check out the pictures. And then she taught hundreds and hundreds of women to do the same thing. So it just shows you what the human body is capable of. But what was so sad is when these people died, this practice, which was never disproven, okay, that the science is very clear that it worked, completely forgotten about business as usual, and that's where a lot of it is today, but hopefully we're on that next wave of awareness right now. Mm. Now, one of the therapies that you explored was, um, was Buteyko. What, do you, what was your impression of that? And how, how did you, did you obviously used it? What was your impression of Buteyko? Tell us a little bit about, for our listener that may not be familiar with it. So Konstantin Buteyko was a Russian cardiologist who had very serious high blood pressure. 212 was, was his number. And he was told he was going to die in a year. And, and they kept giving him drugs, but it wasn't doing too much. And he found that if he slowed his breathing down, if he breathed way less, his, his high blood pressure problems, his hypertension 
completely went away. Mm -hmm. So he said, this is weird. No one's studying this. They're studying all these drugs, but they're not studying breathing. So he went on to study this for something like 40 or 50 years, helped hundreds of thousands of people with, with his method. It's especially effective for asthma. It also works for hypertension. But what he discovered is it was nothing new. This is another one of those pulmonots who just fell upon something that had been talked about in yoga practices and Chinese, ancient Chinese practices thousands of years ago. And it's the idea that we should be breathing in line with our metabolic needs. So we can overbreathe. We're still going to get air that way, but we are just going to overwork our body. We're going to cause it so much wear and tear. It's like if you're in a car and you're at a stop sign and you are just idling and just revving that motor at every stop sign, what's going to happen? <laughs> the car is going to break down a lot quicker and our bodies are the same thing. So many people have heart rates of 90, 90 beats per minute, 100 beats per minute. So you got to get that down. And one of the most efficient ways to get that down is get control of your breathing. So Buteco is associated with these practices of breathing less. So inhibiting air, and some of them are pretty hard to do. But what he's really doing, those practices are like weight, weight training for your lungs, for your respiratory system. So that the other 23 and a half hours of the day, you're breathing in line with your metabolic needs. So he's causing you to hold your breath, to breathe so slow you feel like you're dying, so that you're, you get acclimated to a slightly higher CO2 and you can breathe normally the rest of the time. I've seen people absolutely transformed by, you could call it Buteco method, you could call it Papworth method, you could call it Pranayama. It's all doing the same thing. It is controlling your breath and taking what you need instead of constantly just wasting that air. Mm. I mean, uh, I know we measure life in years, uh, but there are some cultures that measure life in breaths. And you know, you only have so many breaths in a lifetime, so why use them all up too quickly? Um, and that's basically what, what, what they're doing with the Buteco, isn't it? Just slowing it all down. But there's another character out there who is quite amazing and who's rewriting uh, medical textbooks, and that's Wim Hof, who you must have already also, you, I know you also explored, and that's quite a different story. What, what was your impression? Tell us about how you reconciled what Wim, Wim Hof was doing, although you had done deep dive, so you had had some clue there. Go on, tell us what your impression of what Wim Hof is doing. So I learned all these benefits of breathing less and, and breath holding because you want to breathe in line with your metabolic needs. You know, you want to be running efficiently and having that lower heart rate. We know that, that people with a lower heart rate are gonna live longer, right? So it's almost like you only have so many clicks in a lifetime. If you're breathing heavily, your heart rate's gonna go up, which means you're using up those heartbeats. I know this doesn't work out perfectly, but, but if you look at the science of animals who have the lowest heart rates, they live the longest. Animals that breathe the less, they live the longest. So definite connection there. So when I came upon these really heavy pranayamas and Sudarshan Kriya practices, these, I mean, you do some really, really crazy stuff. I thought this is totally the opposite of what mm -hmm. I heard from Buteco and all the Buteco, no, I won't say all, some of the Buteco people are like, don't do that stuff, it's poisonous. <laughs> and I said, but, but look what he's able to do. So it so happened to be two hours before I came here to talk to you, I was on an interview with, with Wim Hof for, for an hour. Wow. I interviewed him about his new book for, <laughs> for a promo in England. Wow, so, fantastic, so we're hot off the press here. It's hot off the press. He's a fantastic guy because he is focusing on allowing the body to not only heal itself, but to push it to limits far beyond what any medical researcher, I won't say any, what most re medical researchers thought possible. He's able to completely take control of his nervous system. He's able to um, hold his breath to a level where his oxygen levels go down 50% and he's perfectly fine. That's not supposed to be possible. He ran a marathon on Everest and bare feet that, that took eight hours. I mean, this is just, he sat in an ice bath for, for an hour and a half, almost two hours and didn't suffer from frostbite or hypothermia because he found a way of breathing. 
So this guy's r- literally rewriting textbooks. And what his, his system is, he calls it Wim Hof method. It's been around for thousands of years. He's the first one to admit that, right? Mm-hmm. So he's very cool about that. Yeah. Is it focuses all the stress of the day. So most of us walk around in this chronic state of, of low-grade stress. We're just ah, frustrated, ah, emails, traffic. This concentrates that stress. When you're breathing the Wim Hof method or TUMO, you are stressing yourself out. You think, why do I want to stress myself out? Because you're focusing that stress. You're learning to take control of that stress. You're learning that you can turn on stress specifically so that you can turn it off. So the rest of the day, you are cool. And the studies that, that I found that really blew me away is people with autoimmune problems, psoriasis, even MS, Parkinson's, the vast improvements that they've shown by breathing in this certain way and occasional cold exposure, you can't argue with data. And so it's so fascinating that he is this uh, real revolutionary in this world. And if he wasn't going into labs and willingly going into any study anyone asked him to do, you'd scratch your head and say, ah, I think he's a magician. He's showing up to every lab that invites him. And that's what's so exciting to me about his work. Mm. And it's interesting to because you you touch on that that this is intentional stress. Not all stress is bad. I mean that's why we exercise, and and to use the breath as an intentional source of stress. I think the word is hormesis. You know that uh, that actually is very powerful to control stress. What a wonderful idea! This is how the human body was designed. Okay, uh, you know when we were living in caves. Most of the time we were just sitting around. People think we were working all day. We weren't. We were working about four hours a day and just sitting around. But occasionally, you know, it would be time to attack a bear or fight off an offender or really do something. So these short bouts of stress, that's how we're designed to live. We're not designed to live with this chronic low-grade stress where a bad email will put you into this this state of anxiety that can last two hours. This is so damaging, keeps you in a constant state of of inflammation. And almost every modern disease can be attached to link to inflammation. So um, it's bad news and and Wim has, has shown the benefits. I do that breathing as often as I can, at least a few times a week. I feel a definite benefit from it as well. But don't listen to me. Look at the data. Look at the lab studies and you can see for yourself. Mm. Well, you put it out there so nicely in in your book and and I think it is fabulous. We'll obviously have links to that. I just wanted to finish up now because we've covered some great territory here, but I wanted to finish up because we're all on this health journey together in this modern world and taking a step back from your role as an author, a writer, a researcher on breath. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge is for people on our health journey through life in this modern world? I think the challenge is to, to weed through all of the information. We're at an age where you can get information from any direction. And uh, what's ended up happening is so much of it is false on both sides of the aisle. So, you know, people who aren't studying in medicine are claiming that things, the immunizations are going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. And that's false. And then people on the other side, uh, a lot of medicine is owned by corporations. And this isn't, you know, any revelation. (laughs) There's many books on this and just read the newspaper and you can see that. So in between those two worlds, I think is really where the, the truth lies. But I would look at studies. I would look at studies done at known universities uh, by respected researchers. I would look at who is funding the studies and that is so important. There's a website called the nnt.org, I believe it is. And what they do is they take studies and crunch all the data. And these are, these are top statisticians, top doctors. They crunch the data and really show you what these medications are doing. Some of them are working wonderfully. Others are actually harming you more than they're helping you. And that website, I think, is one of the most important things for for people to look up before you start taking whatever drug you've been prescribed. Hmm. James, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for your wonderful book. We'll have links to that on on our show notes. So 
Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, I always find it interesting, as you probably have noticed, to ask my guests what they think the biggest challenge is, because uh, we are all on this health journey together and we, uh, in our modern world, it is rather challenging to navigate your way through. And the NNT uh, website that he referred to meant the number needed to treat. And we will, of course, have links to that as well. I think one of the most interesting things I find about James's book is, as I said, that he comes at it from a different perspective and he looks at it in such a historical perspective. And I love to explore lessons from the past. I mean, whether we're talking about the fact that we grew up on a nutrient dense diet and organic foods, I mean, that was just the way humans functioned for millions of years on our journey to become Homo sapiens right up until a few hundred years ago. So, so we had lessons to learn from that, and we don't need randomized double blind control studies to necessarily teach us that. We sometimes just need to look at our past, learn from our past, and, and uh, use some common sense. Uh, and that's why the, his reference to so many of these ancient practices and, and the fact that the byline of the book is the new science of a lost art, the lost art of breathing well, which up until the time that our jaws became narrow and our upper airways became narrow, who even thought of that? Who even thought, we, you know, our ancestors were not work, walking around thinking, am I eating organic or not? Am I eating a nutrient dense food or not? Am I breathing properly or not? These are all questions that we need to take a step back from, simple questions that we need to take a step back from and ask ourselves and it's so accessible and that's what I love about the breath. And that's why I, I put um, sleep and breathe as two of the most central pillars, because if you get those two right, and as we've talked about before, sleeping, a consistently good night's sleep is a function of both quantity, getting enough, which is about eight hours a night for 90, over 90% 90 of the population, and breathing well while you're asleep. Now, breathing well rolls off the tongue very easily, but for the fact that 90%, at least, of the population does not have enough room for all 32 of their teeth through their mouth and in perfect alignment, um, it has implications on our health and specifically on our ability to breathe well. If we didn't, I've used this analogy many times in my own practice, but if we didn't have enough room for all five fingers on our hands, we wouldn't be as blase about it. If we all had to have our fourth finger removed when we were 18 or 20, we would, we, you know, I've never, you wouldn't go, oh, did you have your fourth finger removed when you were dying? Yeah, of course, didn't you? Why? No big deal about that. We just wouldn't have accepted that as normal, and yet we accept this as normal, this crowded mouth as normal, and this narrow airway as normal. And you even get health practitioners saying, oh, it's no big deal whether you breathe through your mouth or your nose. Well, if you've been following this podcast, um, then you'll know that there is a very big difference. And, uh, and just uh, I will share with you uh, an image of uh, an X-ray that we have uh, displayed on one of the brochures in our practice about nasal breathing. In fact, I'll have the brochure as a downloadable um, uh, thing, a uh, downloadable resource that attached to the show note. Now, in that brochure, we really promote the, the importance of nasal breathing because at the end of the day, breathing through your nose has so many advantages. It... Uh, it warms, humidifies and filters the air before we take it into our lungs. So, you know, this is why so many people have, one of the reasons why anyway, why so many people have uh, respiratory issues, uh, asthma, allergies, because they're taking air into their lungs, which is irritated. And uh, it's irritated. One of the reasons is because it's not filtered and warmed. So when we take our air into through our nose, there are five or six levels of filtration. There are the fine hairs, which uh, filter out the uh, particles. There are the mucus lining the sinuses and turbinates, which are antimicrobial. They warm the air. Then you take it in over the... And, and also when you breathe through your nose, 
the body produces a chemical called nitric oxide, which actually is antimicrobial and interestingly antiviral. There's some great research which shows that nitric oxide interferes with the coronavirus, SARS-1, and so presumably it probably does that with, SARS, with uh, COVID-19 as well. So there, then you pass it, it passes through your adenoids and finally your tonsils, and then it enters your lungs. But if you breathe through your mouth, you bypass most of those and put the pressure on your tonsils and adenoids. And uh, that's why people often have sore throats and, and enlarged tonsils, because they're asking to do much more than they need. The other thing uh, you may, have, when James was going through his exercise of three in and seven out, three seconds in and seven seconds out, uh, it may have also reminded you, and again, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, and if you do our Breathe Pillar online course, I'll share this with you then too, but it's a way of switching on that part of our nervous system that is involved in the rest and digest. So there are, there's a part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which functions automatically, mostly, in the background. And there are two parts to that. There's the sympathetic part, which is the fight or flight when we're under stress, and that should only be for a short period of time. And there's the parasympathetic part, which is the rest and digest. And by controlling your breath, you can control your nervous system and switch on your parasympathetic nervous system with what I call a four by four by four, which is not that different from what James was showing you, which, which my four by four by four is four seconds in through the nose, slowly four seconds out through the nose, slowly and four seconds of holding the exhaled breath and repeating that four or five times. Um, and, you, and you've switched on the parasympathetic. So how simple is that? And wouldn't that be a good thing to do just before you're starting to eat, rest and digest? And just before you go to sleep, rest and digest. And I thought it was also interesting uh, about uh, uh, asking him about Wim Hof um, with the, uh, the intentional stress on the system, which is something we'll explore more. And we've talked to uh, Mark Cohen about, uh, about a year or so ago, Professor Mark Cohen, and we'll explore in other podcasts. I just wanted to explore breath from a slightly different perspective, a more historical perspective, and from someone who wasn't a clinician perspective, and I think the book is just fabulous. So the, um, the courses that we're running, the, the Five Pillars of Health uh, course is online. Uh, it's coming. We're starting with the sleep pillar, and we're going to work our way through it. And uh, this is not just a subject that I occasionally touch on and you'll never hear from again. You'll have noticed that we revisit sleep, we revisit breathe, we revisit a whole lot of subjects because to me and in my clinical experience, and as I said, I've been a practitioner for 40 years, telling people something once, um, you may have ticked that box on your clinical notes, but in order to affect change, I think we see it as kind of tapping the hoop along the street. And as soon as you, as long as you keep tapping that hoop, the hoop keeps propelling down the street. But as soon as you stop, it stops as well. So there's a few messages that are recurring, coming at it from different perspectives. I hope you find that useful. I know I did. I really enjoyed James's book. So um, until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.